You want 2021 to be a great year. With good yields on your farm, great memories with your family, and less turmoil than 2020. You are a fighter, one of the farmers that's ready to take 2021 head on and get after it. You're making plans and that's why you're here today. You know there are stakes each and every year that you farm. And while it doesn't get any easier, you need to keep learning and keep improving to stay ahead of the curve. We know those stakes well. And for 19 years, Precision Planting's Winter Conference has provided a way for the best farmers to learn about the newest agronomic research and see for the first time new technologies that can help maximize their farm. And 2021 is no different. All across the world, farmers like you are gathering today to get better. Building a picket fence stand doesn't happen by accident. It happens because you fight each day to be ready for the first day of planting. You know that getting your planter equipped right, maintained right, and set right is key to consistent emergence and key to maximizing your yield. So today, take notes, ask us questions, and when you get home, talk to your precision planting dealer. As you take 2021 head on and get ready to plant its crops, don't do it without knowing that you have a plan in place for your planter, a plan that will help you build your picket fence stand. Well, good morning and welcome to Precision Planting's Winter Conference. We're honored to get to spend the day with you. You know, this is a day that our team looks forward to all year long. As we research agronomic and equipment problems, this is our chance to share those with you so you can go home and prepare for the best growing season ahead. Now, we all know that this last year had some challenges and 2021 is expected to have some as well. But the reality is most of you find yourself in a great position to have a very profitable and successful year on the farm. So throughout the course of the day, you're gonna hear from a number of our different teammates. These are folks from across our organization who've been part of the research and development process that are gonna share with you the latest that we're learning and developing. And you're gonna pick up a bit of a theme as we go through that. And that theme is the picket fence stand. Now, that's not new. We've talked about the picket fence for a number of years, but we've normally focused mostly on spacing and making sure that each plant is spaced correctly. In reality, just like when you're building a real fence, there's a lot more to it than just the spacing. And we're gonna spend most of the day talking about those other variables that in many instances are more critical to making sure you get the uniform crop that you're really going after. So as we do that, there's some things I wanna talk through on the logistics side. Now we're spread out across nearly 30 different locations. Each location will have some unique instructions and guidance. There's a local host who's gonna help guide you throughout the day. They're there to answer questions about the facility, like where the restrooms are, where lunch is gonna be served. And in case you were to have any safety needs, they'll be able to make sure you get taken care of. They can also address questions on the content. You should see a few other folks in the white precision planting shirts throughout the facility. They're there to help serve you as well. They can answer questions regarding the content or if you need anything throughout the day. Now, in addition to the local team, there are some other ways to connect throughout the day. You should have a card that shows you some of these. As you look, those of you on social media, the option to connect on Twitter, Facebook, you see hashtag PP Winter Conference 21. Share what you're learning, thoughts you have about the conference throughout the day. In addition to that, for all of you, there's the opportunity to text in questions. You're gonna hear a lot of content about a lot of different research and products. If there's something you wanna learn more about or that wasn't quite clear, feel free to text a question in. You'll see the phone number 474747. You'll put in the body of the text, the word precision. You'll be asked to opt in and then you can send your question to our team. So the presenters and some other team members are gonna be monitoring that throughout the day and they will then respond directly to you. So if there's any question you have, feel free to engage with us that way. The last way to connect is through a dealer. Now I know many of you are here today because your local dealer invited you. But if you don't know of a local precision planting dealer, you'll see on the card our website and our dealer locator where you can go, put in your zip code and it will show you the premier dealers in your area. I encourage you to connect with this local expert. Our dealers are the experts that help take these, these learnings and this technology to you and farmers like you in your area and make sure they're helping apply them for your conditions. So connect with a dealer 
as you come out if, if you don't know of one already. So with that, we're excited for the day. We look forward to spending it with you. I'm gonna get out of the way and turn it over to Justin McMenemy, who's gonna start us off by focusing on visibility and making sure you can see all the variables of your equipment and in your field to make sure you're able to build the best fence that you can. Welcome. My name is Justin McMenemy, and today Doug Wiegand and myself will be presenting on the importance of having confidence in our equipment in the planter pass. We've titled this conversation, Seeing is Believing. And for a lot of us, that's the approach that we take when it comes to considering new technology on the farm. It seems like anymore there's hundreds of trinkets and toys that can be added on the farm that all promise to add bushels, add time, or add money into our pocket. Today, what we would like to talk about is the agronomic research that precision planning has done and a few simple technologies that can be added on to the planner that give you unprecedented visibility into the performance of the planner and ultimately how to set the planner to best maximize yield potential. You know, I was thinking over the last couple of weeks of, of an analogy. Is there another industry in which a technology has been introduced which completely changed the amount of information available to make a decision? What I came to is the x-ray. So about 125 years ago, a gentleman by the name of Wilhelm Röntgen, who's a professor at the University of Würzburg, discovered the x-ray. And what he discovered is that you could shoot an x-ray through a person and it, those x-rays would pass through their soft tissue and would only be absorbed by the more dense material in their body like their bones. So he could take a picture of a person and what was left on the screen was actually a picture of the insides of that person. And in November of 1895, Wilhelm took the first medical x-ray in human history when he took an x-ray of his wife's left hand. Within one year, the medical industry in Europe and across North America was completely transformed as doctors were now able to collect information to get more understanding of their patient before they had to do a procedure. So now we could diagnose a broken bone without a procedure. We could find kidney stones without a procedure. There's even instances of locating shrapnel within military veterans before having to do a procedure. For thousands of years, the medical profession, the tool in their toolbox to get more information had been the scalpel. They had to start surgery before they had collected all the information. Now with the x-ray, they could collect information before they had to go to surgery. Over the last 125 years, there have been huge advancements in x-ray technology. In fact, x-ray technology is what led to uh, advancements like the CT scan and the MRI machine. The thing I do love about the analogy of the x-ray, however, is that no matter how good the image gets, no matter how good we get at making an x-ray, you always need the doctor. An x-ray can't diagnose a problem. An x-ray can't recommend a solution. You have to present that information to someone who knows what they're doing and they collect that information, apply their knowledge to the situation, and that's how you remedy the solution. And as we view technology on the planner, we view it exactly the same. Technology on the planner is not about replacing the farmer in the tractor cap. What it is, is it's about presenting information to the farmer in the most precious hours of the crop year so that that farmer can take his knowledge and apply it to his farm and his field and each and every pass. You know, if we think about technology on the farm over the last 125 years, we could sit down and we could talk to our dad or we could talk to our grandfather and, and they're never gonna use the word technology and they're never gonna use the word sensor. Now, farmers have known for hundreds of years that it takes moisture, it takes fertilizer, it takes temperature, and it takes air in order to grow a crop. But there was no way to directly measure any of those things. 
And so farmers did what they always have had to do, which is to look to the environment, to look to their surroundings and look for correlation, look for things that happen about the same time in order to find ways to know when it's fit to plant or when their equipment is operating correctly. And so if you sit in the coffee shop long enough, you can hear stories. And we've all heard, you know you can plant your corn when the oak leaves are as big as a mouse's ear. Or we've heard, you know it's warm enough to plant when you can walk across your field barefoot comfortably. And that doesn't apply just to the field conditions being fit. We also know that that has applied to the equipment, right? We've all heard that you know your row units in the ground when you can sit your coffee on the row unit as you plant and it won't spill. And we all know how deep we plant our corn, right? Grandpa told us all how deep to plant our corn because otherwise, why would the good Lord have given us the second knuckle on our index finger? You know, like the medical profession of the late 1800s, oftentimes us as farmers, the best tool we have and sometimes the only tool we have in our toolbox is the knife. And we have to dig into the situation. We have to cut into the situation to collect information to ensure that we're taking the right action. But we also know that we can't dig into everything on the planner. We don't have visibility to everything that's going on in the planner. And so that leaves us in the tractor cab a little bit with our fingers crossed. We plan for the best, we do the maintenance on the planner and we still don't have that information. So we kind of have to have our fingers crossed and hope for the best. We know that the most precious hours of the year are in that planter tractor. And if we have a bad day in the planter tractor, we're set up for a bad year. And we know that the maximum yield potential that that seed will ever have is when it's in the bag. And when we place that seed into the soil, the environment now has the opportunity to start cutting into that yield potential. Now our job as growers across the life of the crop is to limit the situations that cut yield potential out of, our, out of our opportunity. But oftentimes, the best visibility that we have to those yield robbing events is through the back glass of the tractor. We, we know that there are situations that are happening, but we have no visibility to them. And we also know that if there's an issue that happens on the planner that we don't have visibility to, it is very possible that we can fold the planner up, put it away in the shed, and we won't find out about that situation until a week later or, or even more when the crop starts to tell us that there was an issue on the planner pass. And by then it's too late. We've already lost yield potential and often there's nothing we can do to gain it back. So as we think about adding technology to the planner, the goal for us is to have the ability to see an x-ray of what's going on, to be able to put our eyes where we can't otherwise see, to have confidence that the planner is performing at its maximum potential, that we're not having an issue on the planner. If we think about wh what we would wanna measure, what we would wanna have visibility into, there's five critical categories that we think of on the planner, seed, row unit ride, downforce, soil environment, and fertilizer rate. Each of these areas, if we have a problem on the planter, it is going to cost us yield. But to have visibility gives us that confidence. Now, Doug Wiegand, the head of our North American sales team is gonna join us, and he's gonna talk about what it would look like to have x-ray vision on the planter. Doug? Hi, guys. Um, as Justin talked through the pop or the the X-ray, the sensors, um, I say population, but uh, sensor technology in the medical industry, uh, he's he's absolutely right. I believe him. Uh, you know, I think back to my grandpa and the things that I learned from him. He was a very intelligent man, very wise man. Only had an eighth grade education, but his life experience was 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 priceless. Right. And so as you know, he was a very good manager of the planner of the farm of the operation. But as we look at uh, how do we make sensors, that's what we've tried to do here at Precision Planning. And as we look at, if I back up just 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the one thing that we managed on the planner was population. You know, and the, the challenge was 
uh, you know, prior to me working at Precision Planting back 17 years ago, that was all we had as a population monitor. And we'd plant the field, we'd go through the planter, we'd make sure that everything was in good shape. But ultimately, we didn't know how that stand was going to look until it came out of the ground. And I can remember every year walking the fields and I would find glitches that was happening on rows or in areas of the field or sometimes the entire field. It's like, man, what in the world happened here? How did it happen? I thought we had this planter gone through. And so as we look at this, we have a double there. And we got, you know, we got a few singles, but how did that happen? And in the South, cotton or any seed is not immune to that, right? I remember talking to a guy at the Georgia Sunbelt Expo uh, back in 2010. And he comes into the booth and he said, man, I put E-sets on my cotton planter and I planted it. And he said, those, those meters paid for themselves in singulation accuracy alone, just with seed savings, because he wasn't planting as many doubles, right? He was planting a single seed every time. And so as we look at that double, we take it to yield. We go back at harvest time and we pull the ears down. And what do we find? Well, it just didn't deliver, did it? It didn't deliver like the singles alongside. And as we go to the skips at harvest time and we strip them down, those two ears on each side of where I had a skip didn't make up the difference, did they? There was a definite loss. So as we look at population 10, 15 years ago, that's, the, that's all. just like the guy with the x-ray versus the MRI or prior to the x-ray even, that's all they had. Okay, it didn't mean we were bad managers. We didn't have data to be able to analyze beyond population. So as we think through how do we manage, we first got to ask ourselves, what do we manage, right? If you come on to my farm or into my business and you say, Doug, you need to buy this or you need to do this, I'm going to say, what's the ROI? What's the return on investment? If it doesn't pay, why should I do it, right? That's what we all ask, especially in farming, but really in any business. And so as we think through the agronomic priorities of the planter pass, if I go to the agronomist that I work with, he's going to tell me that emergence consistency is critical if you're going to hit high yields. Singulation, you want to have one seed every time, never a double, never a skip. You want to have those single seeds evenly spaced like a picket fence. And then ultimately, we've got to have the right population for each environment that you plant with each hybrid that you plant. And so basically what he's going to say is he, didn't he doesn't just want to put these on a screen, but he wants me to have uniformity and in in consistency in all of these categories. And if I look at this emergence, singulation, spacing, and population, there's three of these that are all seed management. So how, it, it's all about managing seed, hits these top three. If I can get 100% singulation, in other words, it's always one seed, never two, never a skip, then I will also achieve extreme, ac I will ex uh, uh, achieve accurate population, right? Without skips and without doubles, you're going to have 100% target on what you want to uh, put down for population. So as we think through these guys um, and we accomplish all these things, this is ultimately what Grandpa looked for when we went out to the field. It's what you and I look for today. We want to see a picket fence stand. Everything is a single uh, 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 plant. Everything is spaced consistently in perfect space in between. And we want to see uniformity in height across that entire. I don't want to see any variation. I want to see consistent diameter. And even in the South, when we go out and we look at cotton, we want to see the same thing. We want to see consistent emergent singulation and spacing as well as population. And then you get, you get up to Michigan and the, and the Red River Valley in North Dakota and the Dakotas, Minnesota, and they got sugar beets. And same thing. Sugar beets respond strong to emergent singulation and spacing. And then you get out to the Dakotas and sunflowers, right? That's a beautiful picture, isn't it, man? It just it, it makes your heart flutter as a farmer uh, when you see those, those beautiful stands of consistency that you're out there. But ultimately, to accomplish that, it all comes down to managing the seed. And that seed has a lot of variation, doesn't it? 
You, know, you look at this seed pool and you got flats, you got rounds, uh, you pretty well call it plateless, right? In other words, it's just a random mix. But there's large, small, flats, rounds, and some even some odd shaped ones that you don't know what shape you'd call them, right? But ultimately the seed that we plant today isn't just different sizes and shapes, but it also has different treatments on it. And some, some brands, some varieties have a higher level of treatment versus a lower, and that all impacts the meter's ability to manage that seed to one seed every time. And so if I back up to 2002, that was the very first time that we designed a, a meter max stand or a, a sensor to read every seed that was went by it, right, on the test stand. And at that point in time, we were able to analyze a meter to understand that it can plant 96 instead of 99. You see, prior to that, when I talked to uh, the, meter, the meter room guy, Uncle Kenny, Kenny Dill was the guy at that time, and he knew his stuff, and he said, Doug, he said, um, I believed that I had meters planting at 99%. It wasn't until we put sensors on that test stand that I understood they were actually only planting 96%. So he was missing 3% accuracy. He said, once we put sensors on that test stand, once we put the autopilot computer on that test stand, then we understood that we had more errors going on than what we believed on the test stand. And it gave him the ability to then dive in and start to analyze and fix problems within the meter itself. So that sensor on the test stand all of a sudden made Kenny and the engineers better at their job. It gave them the ability to realize where problems happened. And you know, I've always looked at that and I've thought, you know what, the best mechanic in the world will never fix a problem that he doesn't know exists. And so if I can give him a sensor, no different a doctor. And so here we have the MeterMax Ultra stand that we came out with a few years later. And on this stand here, the engineer said, you know what, let's put two sensors on this test stand. Let's put one in the middle and let's put one at the bottom. So we can read singulation, but then also if there's any spacing variation from the meter to the bottom of the tube, we're going to be able to pick that up. And so if I look at singulation's impact on yield, I go back to 2010 in southern Minnesota. There was a dealer we worked with that, that had 20,000 acres worth of data on singulation planting data. And he took that to yield, and he got all the harvest yield data off of those same 20,000 acres. And he correlated uh, all of those operations and all that data to yield. He correlated, he queried it and it shows the singulation impact on yield back in 2010. And then in 2015 in Huxley, Iowa, uh, Monsanto, the Monsanto Research Facility, Brent Schwenecker worked with him there for a few years and he set up a plot planner where they took, uh, and they took uh, um, the, the VSET disc and to create skips, they manufactured skips, they would just plug some holes and, and, and they, he actually manufactured, you can see 0% skips and then 2% and then 4 and then 6. And so Brent wanted to learn, you know, it's one thing to have singulation errors, but what if they're all skips and no doubles? And so he took that to yield and it showed a 2.16 bushel loss for every 1% in singulation loss. So if I have a 96% meter and I can go to 98, that's 4.32 bushel per acre improvement by gaining those 2% in skips. And then he said, let's do it with doubles. So he created and manufactured by, by taking disc and he uh, went out there and he planted at 2% doubles, at 4% doubles and 6% doubles with no skips, all doubles. And the result of that was 0.83 percentage or a bushel loss for every 1% in singulation drop. Now that that next year, 2016, uh, Agco did a plot tour, and they took our V-set disc, and they filled two holes in, the, in that disc. You can see that those are plugged right there. By filling two holes within that disc, it guaranteed that you had two skips every revolution of that disc. And then they took and they drilled, they drilled holes. Instead of filling two holes, they drilled two holes. And by doing that, they guaranteed that you was going to have two doubles 
every revolution of that disk. So by creating two skips and two doubles within every revolution, they still ensured that you're going to have 100% population. If you set it to plant 32,000, that's exactly what it's going to plant. Now, they went to the field and they planted that. And this is a map that shows that planting data or how that planter managed that in the field. You can see the reds are skips and the blues are doubles. And so what they did is every other row, they put a goof plate, a manufactured plate on there versus a standard factory plate. And, and so every other row, they had uh, um, uh, poor skips and singulation. And then, and then on the alternative rows, they had really good singulation. Now they took this to yield. And so here's how it looked. On poor singulation rows, it was 91.4%. On the good singulation, it was 99.3%. So they had a few errors, but very few. <clears throat> when they took it to yield, here's what it looked like. So, you know, the question would be, well, if I have population consistent, the yield probably won't drop, right? Well, actually it will. And so when we followed through, there's 1.1 bushel loss for every 1% in singulation loss. So uh, getting that singulation accuracy is critical, whether it skips or doubles, it's going to cost you money. So the 2018 Precision Technology Institute, Jason Webster up in our Pontiac farm, a research farm that we started doing, uh, that Jason started doing, he did a singulation study. And on that, it showed a 2.1 bushel loss for every 1% singulation. Now, once we get to singulation, singulation is the meter dropping one seed every time, no, no doubles, no skips, and, and the, the ability to take that sensor and measure through software, whether it's a single seed or a double, was a huge advantage in us managing planters and, and fixing meters to the next level. But the next thing as our engineers started to look at is they started taking a high-speed camera and they started looking inside the seed tube and they started to say, um, you know, how is this seed transitioning from the meter to the ground? And as you can see in this high speed video, man, there's a seed that ricocheted and the next one passed it up. That all is just happening in a split second of a time, isn't it? Right? It doesn't take much. And so seed tube ricochet is a real thing. And so instantly our engineers dove in, they designed a new seed tube. They designed a new sensor called Wave Vision. And the reason they designed that sensor is because you'd go out the field and there'd be a lot of dust in on a dry day and your, and your seed sensor was telling you that your population was spiking really high and it was actually just dust. So they designed a tube that, that's a, that, that measures the density of what travels through it. It's not an optical sensor. And so it has the ability to ignore dust. And, and so when it ignores dust, it doesn't mistake that dust as seed. It also accurately reads doubles. And so uh, not only does, is, it, is it at the bottom of the tube, so now I'm picking up actual spacing before it exits the tube into the ground, but it also is, is an improvement in that data gathering that we're after. Now the next thing we look at as we think through singulation spacing population is, is row unit right. You think, well, how does row unit ride play into effect? And so th this is an actual uh, graph or, or chart that Jason Stoller, one of our engineers and his team put together that has an accelerometer on the row unit of the planter. And as that planter is running through the field, that variation, vertical velocities, velocities in inches per second, as you can see, that's the engineering terminology. Uh, as those row unit goes up and down through the field, it's capturing that data, okay? So that is what's called a single row module. It's a processor that the engineers designed here at Precision Planting, and they bolt that onto the row unit, and then, and then it measures that vertical velocities with that accelerometer. Now, let's correlate that to the meter on the planter. And it's out there trying to do its job. It's trying to singulate and get right population spacing and singulation. And I hit it with some bumps. What happens? All of a sudden, you got three seeds that all came off together. Now, those three seeds were metered correctly. The meter did its job. But the row unit ride impacts it negatively. And all of a sudden, what I'm going to see in the ground is not going to be accurate to what that meter did, right? So if I'm going to get singulation spacing and population right, it's more than just the meter. I've got to have a smooth ride. And so that same 2010 study, when they correlated good ride on those 20,000 acres 
to yield, look at the curve. It's almost a flat line. It's amazing from a, from a 92% ride or a 90% ride to a to a a 99% ride was a 15 bushel advantage per acre. That's huge. So the next thing we look at is emergence, right? Now once we can get you know, we get a better sensor, we get accelerometers out there, we can manage our ride. And so as a manager, ultimately these are all better tools to help me manage to the next level. So loss of ground contact and shallow planting, how's that come in? Well, that's the emergence side, right? You see, when I get shallow planting, I'm going to get some seeds and some dry dirt and it's going to be a little slower to germinate and then therefore emerge. When I go out to the field, you and I have all done this, I'm sure, uh, at least I have in my life, I've been to many fields where you see this, this dip in planting. And ultimately, we know without even digging, man, it must be dry dirt, right? Either that or he didn't get it closed right or he didn't, he didn't plant it deep. He must have went shallow. He didn't keep his feet on the ground or his gauge wheels on the ground. And when we follow through them lady mergers to harvest, this is what we find. Over and over again, a, 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 leaf, a, a plant, a corn plant that's one collar behind on average is gonna lose a 50% loss on that ear, right? Two collars behind is a weed. And then we look at the other side of the equation and it's excess downforce. On excess downforce, guys, uh, this, this picture here shows wet and it shows um, ultimately kind of a pretty good lobe down there, right? So what happens when you go out there and you plant in wet conditions and I put excess downforce? Well, what happens is compaction. And so right here is the evidence of that. The plant started growing and those roots didn't want to go into those compaction lobes. Those roots just ran in a hatchet pattern. Now that's not natural. That's influenced by you or I, whoever ran that planter. As we look later on in that corn plant's life, you can see even the brace roots, the older, larger roots, uh, did, not, did not want to go into that compacted lobe. They avoid it. And when I look at the ear that we pull off of those plants, it's always going to be smaller than the ears that could have been, right? You always know when you see compaction around a root uh, that that root would have produced more, that plant would have produced more if I could have alleviated or managed that compaction. As we think through that and we think of excess downforce, we think of that plant, uh, young seed, when it first gets put in the soil, but at V4 is a very critical stage. That's at a stage that that plant is very young, but it is determining the rows around that it's gonna hold on to in the butt of that ear as it starts that ear development. And so if I stress that plant at V4, if those roots are running straight versus going out and getting uh, the best nutrition and environment and water uh, that it can, if I stress it, it's gonna put less rows around. So in this case here, 16 versus 18, what's the cost? Was we've done yield checks over the years and as we've correlated this, for every two rows around, if I take, a, if I take an average of 32,000 ears in an acre, that's a 22 bushel loss or a 22 bushel gain if I can get them back. But me managing that downforce is a big part of that equation. Now, you know, Justin said earlier, the coffee cup, right? And I've been at farm shows and I've talked with guys and I can even remember grandpa talking about that and dad where, you know, yeah, if you put a coffee cup on the row unit and that coffee cup uh, doesn't spill, then that's about the right downforce. That means the, 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 your tillage tool did a pretty good job. You got a pretty smooth environment and you got the right downforce. So we went ahead and we put two coffee cups on two row units. Row unit number one is in notch one. That's the one on the right hand side there. Notch one, these are John Deere heavy-duty heavy T-handle springs and notch one of applied downforce on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, or, row, or the, the row unit number two, uh, we've got that applied force to notch four. So we're going to test this coffee cup experiment. That The coffee cup is the sensor, and it's going to tell us if we got the right amount of downforce. Now, in addition to that, we put a load pin on each one of these planters or these row units, and you can see the downforce, ground contact, and, and the actual weight that the load pin is recording is, is being reported above each row unit. So you can see on the right-hand side, now look at the coffee cup. Yeah, it didn't make it. 
You can also see as it stops, when I look up at the ground contact number, 83% of the time that gauge wheel was carrying some weight. That means 17% of the time it was carrying zero weight. It was going shallow. So we didn't have enough downforce. Uh, the average weight was 34 pounds, but that was with the variation. So therefore, sometimes it was over 34, sometimes it was zero. And then if I look at row two, notch four, had almost 100% ground contact, 100% of the time, with, with 183 pounds of margin. Or, or, or of average weight, which is excess at that point. So ultimately, by putting a load pin on the planter, it gave us the ability to understand which notch to put that downforce in. It, it gave us the ability to manage that extra weight uh, uh, to avoid compaction. And so the load pin, here's a white 9,000 uh, row unit that the load pin goes right there, the downforce sensor. Here's a case 1200 planter that that downforce sensor goes on. And then ultimately here's the John Deere MaxiMerge 5 row unit that has the downforce sensor on it. Here's a field, here's a map uh, from my home farming operation. This was the first year that we went to the field with a load pin on every row. And so we put a load pin on every row of our Kinsey 816 3500. Uh, and that load pin, then this is the map that shows the weight that that load pin was, was running. Now, a blue dot means I lost ground contact, zero weight. And the red is like 300 pounds, the dark red. So there's quite a bit of variation there, isn't there? And so if I look at this map, what you see is the planter was running north and south. But ultimately, do you see the variation that's kind of going on a diagonal? Yeah, pretty good, isn't it? Pretty good variation and pretty extreme when I'm going to losing ground contact to 300 pounds of excess weight all within a, a, a second. And so each one of those dots is one fifth of a second as I travel north to south. So five dots equals one second of time. So as I, as I correlate that, I say, man, what happened? Well, what happened is we had a, a guy that ran the tillage tractor that spring ahead of the planter. He had never ran the tillage tractor ahead of the planter. And so the planter operator called, the, called him before he worked it. He said, hey, work that ground and just work it on a little bit of an angle to the direction that we're going to plant it. Well, that doesn't look like much of an angle, does or doesn't look like a little bit of an angle. It looks more like a 45. But ultimately, what happened is we back up and we really analyze this, is it taught us on our farm that when we run the tillage tractor, we want to run straight with the planter. Now, without that sensor, we would have never done that because grandpa, dad, uncle Mark, uncle Dave, they all said that you need to run the planter the tractor on a little bit of an angle to the, to the planter, the tillage wise, right? So it taught us something different. So when we ultimately back up and we say, okay, well, what's the impact agronomically and financially on downforce management? Here's a plot, there's, there's several plots I'm going to show you there. And, and, and in all these plots come from Ohio State, Advanced Agrolytics, which is a, a agronomy consulting uh, firm, as well as Bex Hybrids, their PFR studies and plots. And so you can see that when I, loot, when I have shallow or, or light weight, uh, 40 pounds of margin, it's a, it's a yield loss compared to 76. And if I get above 76, again, it's a yield loss. So there's a sweet spot, isn't there? When I can find that I'm not compacting and I'm not shallow and just the right amount of weight, I'm going to hit top yield. Guess what this plot showed? Same thing. How about the next one? Same thing, isn't it? There's a sweet spot. When I find that sweet spot, I don't always know where that is because it's going to change based off how much moisture, the type of soil, and, and, and the environment and what, you know, what's happening. But ultimately, what we found in every downforce study that we've ever saw, there's a sweet spot. And if you get too heavy, it starts to decline on yield. And if you get too light, it starts to decline on yield. This is a soybean plot. Same thing. It's not just corn, is it? It's all crops like to have soil that's not compacted and they don't like to be shallow in dry dirt. And so here's another one, 125 versus 150, 151. 250 was excess. So there's a correlating trend 
that we've seen now for over 10 years on downforce plots. And that is if you have too shallow or too light of weight applied to that row unit, you're going to lose yield. And if you have too much weight, you're going to lose yield. It's going to create compaction and there's a sweet spot. So ultimately, that load pin on that planter is a critical tool in order for me to find out how to maximize my return on investment of putting seed in the soil. So I'm going to turn it over now to Justin, and he's going to walk through a couple more um, environmental issues and sensors uh, on the planter. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. When it comes to setting the stage for even emergence and a picket fence stand, moisture is simultaneously one of the most important aspects of the seed environment, as well as one of the most difficult to measure. For generations, the only tool that we've had in our toolbox to understand moisture at seeding depth is a pocket knife. And so we get on our hands and knees behind the planter and we dig. Now we may dig one location, we may dig two locations, we may dig 10 locations. But at the end of the day, we have very, very little information when it comes to feeding into the decision about planting depth. And we know the importance of planting depth and we know that moisture is probably variable across the farm. And so we have to be conservative in that decision. And so that's where we see rules of thumb take place. Like for instance, what we talked about, the second knuckle in our index finger. Now that has proven for generations to be largely successful when it comes to planting a corn crop. And by largely successful, I mean it doesn't lead to crop failure. Right? Grandpa would tell us if he'd had crop failures at the second knuckle. Dad would tell us if we had crop failure at the second knuckle. The other thing we see is that organizations have taken a more uh, analytical approach. And so there are organizations that have done multi-site and multi-year depth studies in an effort to really shine more light into that planting depth decision. And, and what we find is when they average the yield across the, all the locations and across all the years, it kind of points to about a two inch planting depth. And so when we take all this into consideration, when we take the knife, the knuckle, and the bar chart into consideration, that's kind of how we make a decision for planting depth on our farm. And the reality is, is it's taken a couple generations to get to that number. So we know that number's probably not perfect, but at the same time, there's there's safety in that number. We, that number has proven over the years that we're not going to have a crop failure. Now, over the last four years, our R&D agronomy team has been working with growers to plant, to scout, and to harvest depth, tri depth trials. Our goal is to shine the light into that depth decision. We know that there is bushels to be had, there is yield to be unlocked by understanding what goes into making that depth decision. Now, a, a lot of organizations have taken and just kind of averaged all of their yield together to give us one number and, and the average yield at a given depth. We've taken a slightly different approach. As we go into our fifth year of research, we now have over 50 depth plots that we've run across the U.S across multiple soil types and across multiple tillage practices. And what we've done is we've taken a look at all 50 of those locations, and now what we do is we keep track of how often is it that a given depth is the winning yield. By looking at it this way, it gives us how much confidence should we have as we dig behind the planter and as we set that T-handle. How much confidence should we have that we are giving that seed the best environment to maximize the yield potential of the genetics in the seed? And what we found is, is actually quite interesting. Across our 58 yield trials, only 12 times was the two inch planting depth the yield winner. That's a 21% win rate. So as we dig behind the planter and as we set that T handle, we are only unlocking the maximum yield potential from our seed genetics 21% of the time. This is a perfect opportunity for our R&D team to continue to dig into the data, 
So what is it about the environment? What is it about the soil conditions? What is it about the tillage practice that drives the maximum yield to any given depth? And so that's what we've done. We've spent time digging into these yield trials to understand what are the categories that ultimately drive yield when it comes to that depth decision. And we've come to three categories. Now on the whole, these categories are not that surprising. Adequate moisture. You know, moisture is the bedrock on which even emergence is built. We find that warm soil temperatures. We know that from the moment we put the seed in the soil, it takes 100 GDU to get to a spike. And so the warmer the soil environment is, the faster that we'll get from seed to spike. And then lastly is resistance to emergence. That seedling has to fight its way to the surface. And so every quarter inch, every half inch more that it has to fight through is another time or another quarter inch for something to go wrong. Now what we find is that in practice, these three categories are often in competition with each other. You know, as we know, if you go deeper in the profile in order to find moisture, we're going to give up some temperature and we're gonna increase the amount of distance that that seedling has to fight to get to the surface. And so what we find is that across our depth plots, these three categories are trading off with each other really to find ultimately what depth shows us maximum yield. Now I understand what you're thinking. Okay, Justin, this is great information. It's helpful. Sounds like you put a lot of effort into it. But I don't know anything about my field as it pertains to this teeter-totter. I'm still digging in one place. I don't know what the resistance to emergence is. I don't know how I can apply this knowledge to my situation, to my farm, to this year. And that's where Smart Firmer joins the conversation. Smart Firmer is a sensor that we have put on the side of the Keaton Seed Firmer. Smart Firmer can be installed on almost any planter that has been sold in the last 15 years. And what it does is it rides in the furrow and it looks at the sidewall and it's able to measure the amount of moisture in the soil right there at planting depth. So now, instead of just digging in one, two, or 10 locations behind the planter, we now have moisture information across the entire field. So for the first time, as a grower, you can see an x-ray of your field you can see how moisture sits in the field across the entire farm. You can see how moisture is affected by sand knobs, how moisture is affected by the low ground, how moisture is affected by our tillage practices. We now have the ability to take the knowledge that we know that crop must go into moisture and apply that directly onto the farm. So if we take and we look at a number of our yield trials and we dig into them, I want to show you guys some of the things that we've learned. So here's an example. Now, Smart Firmer is going to give us a number that we call furrow moisture. And our research has shown that for corn, a furrow moisture of 30% means that there's enough moisture in the soil to germinate the crop. And so as we are planting the field, we're going to be getting a furrow moisture number and it's going to show us whether it's above or below 30%. So here's a field that we planted and it's a conventional tilled field. Now what happened as we came to plant this field is between the tillage pass and the planter pass, the sun came out and it got windy. And so on the day of planting, as we were putting in this depth plot, what we saw is that that 30% furrow moisture line was actually two and three quarter inches below the surface. And at two inches, we only had about 18 or 19% moisture. Now this is not talking about a yield book publishing after the combine. This is information that is available right in the planting pass, right when we are making the depth decision with the T-handle. So we had the information on the day of planting to apply our knowledge of planting into depth and we could have known, we could have predicted with confidence that the yield potential of that field was most likely going to be at that two and three quarter inch depth. 
as we think about the balance on this field, that moisture, which is usually the biggest rock, and it's going to push the teeter-totter its direction, that moisture pushed us deeper into the planting profile. Now, it was at the expense of temperature, it was at the expense of distance to emergence, but moisture is king. We want to put the crop into moisture. As we came back and we harvested this plot, what we saw is that there was an 18 bushel difference between planting the crop at two inches and using the information from Smart Firmer, applying our knowledge to the situation and planting the crop at two and three quarter inches. Now, if we take this same knowledge and this same sensor and we go to a different field on the farm, now this field is a minimum till field. This field has a lot more clay content in the soil. And as we went to plant this field, what we saw is that that 30% furrow moisture line was actually sitting at the one inch mark. Now we're not gonna plant our corn at one inch. We don't recommend planting corn less than an inch and a half. But what we saw, we had the information available to it at our fingertips on the day of planting that there was more than enough moisture to germinate the crop at an inch and a half. So if we think about the balance here, we now have moisture and temperature and less resistance to emergence pushing us towards a shallower planting depth decision. We could have known with some confidence that the maximum yield potential was to plant at an inch and a half. And we came back and we scouted after emergence and that, that is what we saw, that the maximum yield potential for this field and for this year was at that inch and a half depth. As we came back through with the combine, we saw that there was a 10 bushel difference between planting at an inch and a half and planting at two inches. Now, if we take all of our research and we combine it into, into learning or into, into a recommendation, what we have found is that across many different soil types, across many different seasons, across many different tillage practices, that 30% furrow moisture line is going to move. It's going to be at different places. In some fields, it's going to be at an inch. At some fields, it could be as deep as three inches. And what we've seen is that by using Smart Firmer, we can know where that 30% furrow moisture line is, and we can apply our knowledge to that field and to that day. Now, if we remember, the win rate of the second knuckle was 21%. 21% of the time when we dig behind the planter in one spot and we set the T-handle to where grandpa set the T-handle, we're going to win, we're going to have a yield winner 21% of the time. As we look at our 58 plots across four years and across the country, what we have found is that if we take the information from Smart Firmer, if we take the x-ray of the field from Smart Firmer, we provide it to the grower, and he takes his knowledge of needing to plant into moisture and applies it to the situation. When we planted the crop into more than 30% furrow moisture, at least an inch and a half deep, across our 58 plots, there was an 81% win rate. This is huge. This is a 4X increase in the win rate. And the reality is, is we are not changing our farming practice whatsoever. We have the same planter. We have the same genetics in the bag. We have the same fertility program. We have the same landlord. All we are doing is adding information to the decision on the day of planting from that field. And what we find is that 60% of the time, between using the knuckle and using Smart Firmer, 60% of the time we are leaving bushels on the field. Now I wanna be clear, we're not talking about a train wreck of a situation against the most beautiful stand you've ever seen. We're not talking about a field that you would walk up to and say, man, I should have planted a different depth. Sometimes we're talking about three, four, five bushel. Sometimes as you saw in the example, we're talking about 10. The, 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 the hidden issue with two inches of planting depth across the farm is that it doesn't win very often, but it doesn't train wreck. So we feel a comfort. We feel that there's security in that number, 
but we're leaving bushels on the field. The next topic that I'd like to talk about of adding visibility to the planter pass is the fertilizer application. You know, I was preparing this presentation and, and a friend of mine, he was, he was kind of working, working with me. He said, Justin, I completely agree that fertilizer application is something that we need to have visibility to, but I don't think that my grandfather or my great-grandfather had fertility on the planter pass. So does, it, does your analogy break down? And I said, well, let's, let's take a look. So I pulled up this picture. It's of my grandfather, Henry Schulte, putting the 1925 corn crop in. And I showed him the picture and I said, well, I don't know about you, but I actually see fertility on that planter pass. And I also know that my great-grandfather was very keen at keeping an eye on that fertility program. Now, namely, he didn't want to step in it, and he didn't want it to splash up onto his shoes, but he was very interested in keeping an eye on his on-planter fertility program. As we think about our fertility program, as we think about our liquid system, oftentimes this is the best visibility we have through the back glass of the tractor. And for many of us, what we do is we evaluate our fertility program and our liquid system by looking at those two tanks. Are they still even? When's the last time I filled them up? How many acres have I gone over since I filled them? For most of us, that's as much visibility as we have. We also add red balls to the planter. You know, I've, I've talked about red balls for a number of years, and, and one of the things I've heard over and over again is, well, you know, Justin, I mean, red balls, they're cheap insurance. You know, the problem with cheap insurance is that the policy doesn't cover the damage. You know, I had this picture in my presentation for two days before I realized that there's actually a set of red balls there on the back, the back half of the planter in the center. And that's what we do. We put the red balls on there. We remember to look at them at the first day. We get busy. We get going. And by the end of the year, we might be looking at them after the refill, but we might go days without looking at the red balls. We don't have that visibility. I was talking about red balls and, and the cheap insurance to a group of growers. And, and after my presentation, I had a, a grower come up to me, beeline right for me. And he said, Justin, don't even get me started about red balls. Now, just a little word to the wise. If somebody leads with, don't even get me started, just go for the ride. The reality is, they're already started. There's nothing you can do. Just enjoy the ride. He said, so this is a grower is in southern Illinois, and he plants about 2,000 acres of corn. And he said, I had just bought a brand new John Deere 1770 NT, and I put an electric starter system on there, and I put a variable rate two by two system on there. And I was gonna run five gallons an acre of starter, and I was gonna run 31 gallons of 28. So he's running a lot of nitrogen through his planter. This is about half of his nitrogen program that he has on the planter. He said, now I'd had problems with liquid systems before, and so I put the red balls on there, and then I bought a GoPro, and I mounted the GoPro on the planter, and I pointed the GoPro at the red balls, and I had an iPad in my tractor just so I could keep an eye on the red balls, because I was not going to get bit again by a problem with my liquid system. So they get going, feeling out the new planter. Things are going well. He says, overall, the season went really well. We fold up the planter. We put it in the shed. Emergence looks beautiful. I'm feeling good. So we go back and we scout a few weeks later when the corn's about six inches high. And he said, I start to see some yellow streaks. I start to see some rows that are, that are yellow. And he said, I'm, I'm starting to get a little nervous. The corn, corn's having a bad day. He said, I go back and I scout again when the corn's hip high, and now I have sections that are eight and nine inches difference between one row to the next or between one section of the field to the next. We're not just having a bad day. We're having a bad year. And so he, he goes back to the shed. He pulls the planter out of the shed. And he says, what happened? What happened with this planter? He starts tearing the planter apart. And he says, I take the liquid system apart and I get to the pump, the two by two pump. And on the inlet of the pump is a piece of seed bag. 
So during the season, as they were filling hoppers, a piece of the seed bag had gotten into the tank and worked its way to the inlet of the pump of its two by two system. And for most of the year had been blocking the inlet of the pump. And so his two by two rate was dipping and diving across the field. He said, man, it was painful. I went through the field with the combine. He said the first 180 acres, we didn't have the problem. The last 1,700 acres, we did have the problem. He said farm average across the two sections of the farm, we were off by 15 or 20 bushel, all because of the seed bag. So if we think about 15 bushel at $3.70 corn, across 1,690 acres, it's a $94,000 kick to the pants. And, and, and the, the part that frustrated him so much is that he knew to look out for it. He had paid for a sensor to give him visibility so that it wouldn't happen again. And then he bought another sensor aimed at the first sensor so that it wouldn't happen. And what happened? He didn't have the visibility. He didn't have the ability to know that his planter was not performing and it cost him and it cost him big. So this is where we talk about a product that we sell called FlowSense. FlowSense is a flow meter that can be installed on each and every row of the planter. And what it does is it reports back and it gives us a row by row understanding of how much flow is on each row. We were talking with a grower in central South Dakota, and he runs a 24-row Kinsey 3600. Now he runs 28 with a shot of ammonium sulfate, and his target rate is 34 gallons to the acre. And he had run this system and he'd run this program for years with a planter-wide pump and a set of red balls. And for years, that system had told him that he was doing a good job. He was hitting his rate across the planter, and the red ball said, keep on going. He installs flow sense on the planter. He goes out, he plants the first field, and this is the x-ray that he gets. This is the visibility that he gets into his fertility program. If we dig into one pass, we see that he's putting three different rates across his entire farm. The right-hand side of the planter is running 40 gallons to the acre, while the middle section of the planter is only running 30 gallons to the acre. And he learned a lesson that a lot of growers have learned as they've put flow sense on the planter. And that is, it absolutely matters where you mount the pump. He had put a ground drive piston pump on the right drive tire over on the far right side of the planter, and it was feeding those rows way more than his average rate. It also matters how long are the lines as you go from the pump to each row. Because that, that second section, those middle rows, he had extra long lines to weave and wind and wander through fold points. And because of that, he had 27% variability on his planter. It had been there for years, but without better information, without an x-ray of his equipment, there was nothing he could do to fix it. So we've set up a little test stand here that allows us to compare the visibility that we have with a set of red balls to the visibility that we have with FlowSense. We've set up this test stand with an electric pump and we've plumbed it as if it were an eight row planter. So let's turn it on here. Now we're running a target rate of around 18 to 19 gallons. And so if we look at the red balls, the red balls are gonna tell us that we're doing good. If we're looking through the back glass of the tractor and we see that the red balls are lined up like this, we have the confidence that we can keep going. But if we look at the visibility that we get with FlowSense, we see that we're hitting our average rate of about 18 and a half gallons per minute. But what we see is that we have a number of rows that are high and a number of lows that are low. In particular, we see that row seven is actually running around 16 to 16.3 gallons per minute, while row three is up over 21 gallons per minute. So the red balls don't give us the visibility that we have 25% row to row variability on this planter, but by using FlowSense, we get that x-ray, we get that information, 
in a high fidelity sense that allows us to see that we have a problem on the planner that needs to be fixed. You know, I was in a phone call. I got a phone call a couple, about a year ago, and it was from a dealer, and he had been working with a grower on uh, some yield trials. And he calls me on a Tuesday, and he says, hey, Justin, uh, I got a situation for you, and I'm wondering if FlowSense can help. I said, okay, uh, what, what exactly is going on? And he said, well, we're pushing yield, and as part of pushing yield, we're testing some fertilizer combinations, and we really want to maximize the amount of nutrients that we're carrying in the fertilizer. So we're starting with a 1034 O base, and we're adding quite a few additives to this. And we knew going into the trial that the chemistry's not going to hold together on this mixture. So what we've been doing is we've been tank mixing. So we'll fill it with 1034 O, and then we'll live mix the, the, the product in, and then we'll plant so that we can get it out into the field before the chemistry falls apart. And that was the plan, and it was going really well until last week, late last week, a storm came in and knocked us out of the field. So that planner has been sitting now for the end of the week, the weekend, Monday, and here we are on Tuesday, and we're getting ready to go plant, and uh, it's pretty interesting what's in the tank. And I, I was just wondering if that was something that FlowSense would give me visibility. Now, I've been involved in a lot of these conversations, and I've heard of guys that are putting fish guts on. I've heard of guys that are putting stuff that pours like molasses. I've heard of stuff that pours like motor oil. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, okay, what, what's the situation here? And I said, so, so what exactly are we looking at here in the tank? He says, well, if I were to describe it, I would say it looks like, like chewed up SpaghettiOs. Oh, uh, what do you mean? Well, it's got kind of an orangish tint to it, and, and um, it smells kind of funny, and it's got a lot of floaters. And I was just wondering, is that something that FlowSense can handle? So we took that as a challenge. And, and this year we've announced, and we're going to have in the marketplace, a magnetic version of FlowSense. So that we can now pump anything through FlowSense, and it's going to continue to give us visibility into our fertility program, visibility into our liquid system. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to pump SpaghettiOs. So we've got a two tank system here. Right now we're pumping water and we're going to add these SpaghettiOs to the, to the tank here. And now we're going to switch tanks. We're going to switch from the water tank over to the SpaghettiOs tank. So now we're pumping SpaghettiOs through our pump, through our planter, and we can now see through the red balls, this isn't water anymore. We're now pumping a slurry of noodles and thick, thick sauce. Now if we look at our red balls, we have even less visibility than we've had before. We still might be able to see the the balls every once in a while, but by and large, we have less visibility than we did before. But if we look at FlowSense, we now have the same amount of visibility that we had previously. So now we're running about a 20 gallon an acre average. So we now see that our rate is right around the same. We see that same low row. Row seven is still about three gallons off the average and row three is about three gallons above the average. So we've changed the density of the product We've changed the viscosity of the product, and we still have as accurate a measurement into our fertility program and into our liquid system hardware as we've, ha as we've ever had. You know, as we think about adding visibility to the planner pass, for us, the way that that happens is with the 2020 monitor. The 2020 monitor project started around 15 years ago. And the passion of our organization at the time was to put the precious hours of the planter pass to give as much information as possible to you in the tractor cab, to know that the planter is performing and to know that the planter is set for maximum yield, to give you an x-ray into how that planter is operating. And so as we think about the 2020 in the cab, it's going to give us visibility to those key measurements that we've been talking about. 
We'll have visibility into our seating information with, si with singulation and population and percent skips and percent multiples. We'll have visibility into our downforce. We'll have visibility into our row unit ride, into our furrow moisture from Smart Firmer, and then also our liquid system at, with FlowSense. We're also gonna take and we're gonna lay that information like a map out over the field so that we can also look and see patterns of the information, the patterns of the data as we go across the field. Now I know what you guys may be thinking. You know, this is a lot of numbers. There's a lot of information. Justin, there's so much going on in the planter tractor. I'm not gonna be able to look at all these numbers. And, and that's not what's expected. The system and the, the information is all color coded so that we can collect information about all of the systems on the planner with one glance. So if we glance down to the 2020 and we see all green, it means go. It means the system is working, the planner is performing, keep going. If we glance down and we see yellow, it means we might want to dig in, we might want to understand that subsystem to see what's going on. And if we look down and we see red, that means that it's time to put the clutch in. It's time to stop the planter because we are losing yield. We're leaving yield potential on the field. And so at a quick glance, just based off of the color, we know the performance of the planter. And so with the 2020, it becomes the x-ray. It becomes unprecedented visibility into the planter. And just like the x-ray, it can only highlight the health of the system. You as the PhD of planting, you're the one that takes that information in, applies the knowledge you have about how to maximize yield on your farm and adapts to the situation. As we closed, I wanna share with you a conversation that we had with Rick Onken from Rudd, Iowa. Rick has been planning for a number of years and he just recently added the 2020 to the planter pass. And Rick shares with us the visibility that he has and the changes that he's made on his planter, including changes to his plates and changes to his downforce springs. These are the conversations that fuel our fire to, to continue to bring information to your fingertips in the most precious hours of the planter pass. Thank you and have a good day. Hi, I'm Rick Onken, um, I farm in Northern Iowa, and we've been farming here f since um, I started with my dad when I graduated from high school and been here ever since. The reason I think that um, you have to get the crop in the ground correctly, uh, I've had some years where my planter has messed up and the operator too, I guess. As far as, you know, seed placement and everything, um, you know by the end of the year if that seed placement is wrong. Well, you know it before that because when you check your crops out as they're coming up, it's a poor, poor ear on the stalk. And that just relates back to how you put it in the ground in the spring. And if it's not in the ground correctly, just doesn't grow. Uh, when I decided to uh, start with precision planting, I was having some difficulties with my planter monitors and stuff, and I got frustrated with them. And um, I talked to my lo local um, precision dealer and went to a couple of his meetings and I liked what he was showing me. And he was real good to work with and still is. The 2020 is really, if you, you gotta believe what the monitor tells you, because I thought I was smarter than the monitor and I kept planting one year. And it, when I realized the monitor was smarter than me, I stopped and, and actually fixed what was wrong. And you could see it right to the roll on my yield. As the old saying goes, you know, what you sow is what you reap. And that fall, that ground didn't, didn't reap like it should have. This last year, I had all new plates in and everything, and everything was worked just perfect. I was back up to my 99.8 singulation and population was exact for the acres I planted where I wanted it. Everything was, I was really happy. Since I started using my 2020, um, you can scroll through and have it 
running on different things and you can key into, if you're not sure about your down pressure, you can watch that and you can change that. So you have good um, soil contact. And also with, um, it tells you if you're bouncing too much. So when you bounce, it messes up your seed placement. When I quit at night, I'm not as tired because I guess I'm not as stressed out, hoping that it's all, I hope I did it right. And I'm, if the monitor says I did it right, then it's, I'm pretty sure it's in the ground correct. The satisfaction is when you see the stuff coming up out of the ground, yep, the monitor was right again. To be real honest with you, I'd fight somebody to, if I had to give that 2020 up. So I believe the technology has made me a better farmer because I'm more cons conscientious um, about what I'm putting in the ground and how it's going in the ground. Whether you're a young farmer or an old older guy like me, um, don't be afraid to try it and give it a year before you want to throw it back in the box and get rid of it. I think you'll, you'd be really pleased with it.